Artificial intelligence has been around prominently longer than you might think. On this edition of Digital Futures, we want to explore where this is being used now, if it's evolved successfully from its initial goal of making intelligent machines, and we want to fill you in on what you and I as consumers need to know about. I'm going to raise all these points and more with my two incredible experts, AI architect and author of In Our Own Image, George, and Rollo, an AI pioneer and creator of Cleverbot, which we'll be trying later, by the way. Guys, thank you for doing this. Thank you. So let's set the scene a bit before we dive straight in to what promises to be a very, very debate-worthy topic. As it stands now, where are we with the development of artificial intelligence? And can you quickly demystify this for an everyday consumer? We are now at a stage where artificial intelligence is coming of age. It matures as a technology and is becoming more, if you like, visible and felt in everyday life. For instance, starting from Siri and Cortana, digital agents with whom we can actually communicate in natural language, to uh, businesses which use uh, machine learning in order to uh, go through their data, mine them, and uh, gain new insights about uh, their consumers or their employees. So we are at this stage right now, and I believe that it's uh, the reason why uh, AI is debated in, in the public sphere as well. Well, I would say that um, we are right at the beginning of the AI revolution, uh, that um, we only recently have, uh, has enough computing power and data become available for people to start making discoveries. Uh, in my own field of, of natural language, um, people are discovering things thick and fast, um, but a lot more will be coming. Um, there will be a, a, a revolution, if you like, in the way that we interact with machines, becoming much more verbal mm -hmm. and um, uh, taking away from visual interfaces, replacing them with something new. Okay. So now my next question is very loaded and a little bit lengthy, so bear with me. When we watch videos of humanoid robots out in the real world, that can be a little bit unnerving, understandably. And a lot of sci-fi films are based on the premise that we as humanity could get to a point at which we won't be able to control our own AI-powered creations. And then you've got big influencers and really big names such as Hawking, Gates and Musk publicly warning us of the dangers of AI. Now, could robot technology, for instance, actually obliterate humanity? But how, how much of this commentary out there is scaremongering, George? Well, I think the uh, scaremongerous uh, sort of argument is very flawed, at least uh, in three ways, uh, what I would call the three fallacies of AI scaremongering. Uh, first of all, technologically, they assume that technology will keep uh, advancing according to Moore's law, uh, which is not necessarily the case. In fact, most engineers now see uh, a leveling of uh, Moore's law in the way that technology scales up. The second is uh, what I would call sort of the body-mind duality. For some reason, they assume that the mind, intelligence or consciousness is something that is disembodied, does not relate to a physical body, doesn't need a body to exist. And uh, this sounds very much like a religious statement indeed. And uh, also uh, what we know about from science, from biology, from your science and your biology is, is, is something completely different. You need a body in order to have a mind and consciousness. And the third fallacy, I think, I would call it the identity fallacy. We anthropomorphize artificial intelligence in a, in a big way when we think that it will uh, have malice or have uh, negative feelings about us. If you want to, you know, that kind of intelligence, you only have to have a human to, to, be, to destroy the world. You don't need artificial intelligence to get into the, all that trouble. Rollo, would you concur with George? I would. I would concur largely with George's uh, view that it is, it, it, the scaremongering is, is unrealistic. I would prefer to bring up a, a sci-fi movie that, um, that is generally positive um, or at least sees AI as benign, which is um, the, the movie Her, um, Spike Jonze's film in which Joachim Phoenix uh, falls in love with a, with a machine. Uh, there's an extra reason why um, I would bring that up, though, which is that while watching it, I had a spine-tingling feeling that uh, this was not a coincidence, that there were too many similarities to something. And um, a few months later, um, I saw Spike Jones I interviewed where he said, yes, he was inspired by, seeing uh, by interacting with my program, Cleverbot, um, yeah. to make that movie. And um, so I like to feel that that's the, the, the kind of approach that 
um, that, that AI can take, the, mm. the, the direction that it can Nice go. to know that there was a connection there with something that you've created. How satisfying. Now, there's a lot to take in there. Let's talk now about some of the major benefits that AI can bring to humanity. What are some of the positive uses of AI to date that you've seen and the sectors that stand to benefit most from advancements in AI? Rollo. I'd say that it's much more than just talking to machines or the next gadget from the big tech companies. Uh, it's, I believe it should be significant in advancing the whole of science. Um, and there are a lot of important reasons for wanting that, uh, such as material science. We need things like um, superconductors. We need um, superior uh, uh, solar power technologies um, to start making a difference to our world. And only by uh, enhancing the tools that we use to, um, to discover, make discoveries can we possibly achieve those sorts of uh, very important world goals. Uh, we're talking here about a major disruption for economy, society across almost every every sector. I can't imagine any sector of the economy which will not be disrupted because of that what the artificial intelligence will be doing. I totally agree that science will benefit greatly but you have to think about other other areas of the economy as well. Wherever you've got data or big you know great masses of data it's only through artificial intelligence techniques like machine learning for instance that we'll be able to mine this data and make, make use of them, correlate them, layer them over and so forth. Yes, so managing the, um, the, the change that is going to happen in, the, I in future um, as a result of AI is much more important than the danger of AI ever taking over. Absolutely, I totally agree. I totally agree. And it's uh, how we will impact, for example, uh, our work, our jobs, how we will impact the way uh, companies function, indeed how we will impact our relations. So I totally resonate, you know, I find it very interesting what uh, Rollo just said about, uh, you know, the, the movie Her. It will be a different way we will relate uh, with each other and with machines. So actually, maybe the media have a role to play here in putting out a lot more commentary than they do um, to counter some of the very negative pieces of press out there about how robot technology will obliterate humanity and displace jobs on a wide scale. Now, George, I want to stay with you. You raised some very, very compelling points in a video you recorded for your recent book. Could you tell us why exactly you think that humans strive to perfect artificial intelligence? Well, I'll tell you why, why I sort of um, uh, did a PhD in artificial intelligence. I thought uh, it would be a great way to understand the, the human being. You know, and I think uh, you know, that's what drives people into exploring everything around the human. And artificial intelligence, at least in the, in, you know, originally, is a way of modeling uh, the human mind on a computer and studying it. Now, I want to open this one up to both of you. One of the long-term goals, it seems, within the field of AI is for creativity and social intelligence to coexist. Is the end result here then a robot with its own mind? George? I believe that um, it is theoretically possible at some time in the future to be able through a different kind of electronics perhaps, a different kind of approach to the whole idea of AI. I mentioned before that I don't believe in minds outside bodies, so it has to be some kind of embodied artificial intelligence. I believe it is possible to create uh, uh, something that uh, will awaken to the fact that it exists and I think that will be a very interesting moment in history. Rollo? I also believe that a machine that thinks in a genuine sort of a sense is possible. Um, that evolution happens to have discovered one way through, or maybe a few ways, through which it can be achieved. And, um, but there are others, and that they don't require perfect imitation of the human brain or anything of that kind. Rollo, George, this is really riveting to me and hopefully to our viewers as well. Thank you so much for doing Digital Futures. I've massively enjoyed this conversation. Thank you for being here. Thank, Thank you. Some might say that if we're the ones creating AI, then it should be within our power to control its exact use and applications and therefore mitigate some of the concerns around it. Or might that just defeat the very purpose? Tell us what you think on Twitter using the handles that'll flash up on screen right now.